everyone, Tony Winston here, Jazz Piano College. Uh, got a request to cover Stella. I've covered it before. I've got a, a video where I do a penta map, where you know I take each chord of the song and talk about the pentatonic scales that can be used. And that's a good idea. Uh, something that McCoy Tyner did uh, quite a lot was uh, to use those pentatonic scales. So I can't do a beginner video on this song because I'm sure I went through kind of the beginner steps on this song in some of the previous videos where I just kind of, you know, talked about the chords and maybe some open voicings. So <clears throat> all I'm going to do in this video is talk about the great version by uh, George Benson and McCoy Tyner is in the band as well. And they do it as a quartet. And they also do it, I think, on a kind of a big band album uh, with Marty Page as the arranger. They've got a, like a smaller horn section behind them. My favorite arranger by far. I just, I just love Marty Page. Uh, so do listen to that. I put a link down in, in the description. And uh, you know, I worked this out years ago for myself, and I used, used to play it in this key. And I just love the way George Benson does it. Starts off like that with a nice bebop line to bring the song in. Actually, it starts like this. Something like uh, so it's a reharmonization, which I'll go over real quickly uh, in a minute. So normally it would be a two five one because we're in the key of G here. We're not in the key of B flat like uh, most people play it. Uh, so. We're just up a half step doing that 2-5, and then we go to the real 2, and then the 5, and back here. And he does such a great little G major 7th, or 9th, G major 9th, and E, kind of like an altered thing here, all right? And this comes from, like, the diminished series there of 7th of, uh, chords. Uh, Barry Harris talks about that a lot. Uh, so anyway, it's just a cool sound. <laughs> it's funky. And the old uh, term funky doesn't have to do with a funky rhythm so much as just a funky sounding chord, like a sharp nine chord, you know. It, it's a chord that makes you scrunch up a little bit, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's got that kind of... A, feel to it. I think I played it real slowly a minute ago, and I'm going to write out a arrangement, just a sketch, really, of, you know, how you can voice this, because it's down pretty low on the piano, and, you know, maybe you don't want to play it in this key, because it is so low, but I enjoy soloing on it in this key, so I did it that way. Uh, now let's go over the reharm at the end, and I'll start at the halfway point of the song. times people will diminish that chord and then resolve it. Now you would expect B minor 7 flat 5 to E, but let's take it up a half step and then do it. And then we'll do the same kind of thing at, like we did at the beginning. So you see it's a series of two fives. C to F, B to E, blah, until you get to the real 2-5, and then we're down to the, to the G. Something McCoy Tyner does in his solo, a couple very interesting things. One, he uses a lot of chords, and at one point starts playing the chord progression just in chords, but on every third beat. So you have to, I would suggest writing it out, because... Occasionally, you have to play one of the chords twice. Otherwise, you know, the chord progression is going to get scrunched up into the wrong place. Now, a few other things I noticed about McCoy's solo, and, you know, I was trying to sound like him the other day, but when I played back my, <laughs> my solo, you know, I was just stabbing at the chords. And McCoy, you know, he, he hits the chords and kind of holds them down. So he's got a little bit more support with his left hand, you know, while he's doing all that stuff. You 
know, sometimes he even rolls it a little bit. So he's, he's you know, creating a nice texture uh, with his left hand. And George Benson, during McCoy's solo, he does the most wonderful thing that any guitar player can do when the piano player is taking a solo, especially like this. He's, he just goes like this. <laughs> he doesn't play, all right? Because, I mean, he's not sure exactly what reharmonizations McCoy's going to do. And, you know, to add another chord on top of the chords that McCoy's playing, and they're going to be in the same range, it's just going to cause trouble. And uh, George knows it, and McCoy knows it. I'm, I'm sure McCoy did not have to say to George, lay out during my solo. I mean, this is just something guitar players should do, and they, they don't realize, on a jazz tune, they, they don't realize uh, that that's what you got to do. And when I'm playing with the band and the guitar player starts playing during my solo, I just put my left hand behind my back and work with my right hand. All right, that's all you can do, right? Otherwise, you know, you're going to play you know, a, a flat nine chord and they're going to play a regular nine and, and it all goes to hell. One cool thing McCoy does in the solo is uh, right near the end when it comes back to and then they go into that reharm, he doesn't play a minor 7 flat 5 and an altered chord. <laughs> Not during his solo. He, he plays like just a regular minor 7th and like a, you know, like a 13 chord. And uh, let me, I'll just try to do it. So we're... Uh, Okay, so two ideas there. One, instead of going to C sharp minor seven flat five, I just went to a regular C sharp minor and you know played the appropriate scales. I guess it would be the uh, the B major scale, All right? Because that's that's where that two five is going. And then we get into the uh, standard reharm that they do: C minor to F, uh, B minor to E. And here, I took an idea, and this is a McCoy Tyner idea, but he doesn't do it on this particular song, but uh, I think it's on his first album from Satin Doll or something. It's got a similar type of a change, and he plays like an 11th chord, that's B flat minor 11th, with this nice little triad up here, giving you some of those uh, tensions. And then for the E flat dominant, he does this with this F triad. That gives you a sharp 11 there in addition to the 9th and the 13th. And I've got some rootless voicing supporting that. And then he does the same thing in the next two fives. So. I believe like in Satin Doll, it's, uh, what does it do? It goes... Uh, Yeah, he, he does it. I'm pretty sure he does it. Uh, what's the name of that album? Is it Inception? I don't know. There's a lot of good stuff on that album. And you can hear how advanced he was becoming, even back then. Even though it's very kind of straight-ahead jazz, and he's playing a lot of, you know, your typical kind of lines and stuff. Uh, he keeps, like, throwing some of that, you know, advanced harmony and using some fourths and... Uh, stuff like that, just occasionally. And what's so neat is this, then he goes through this whole metamorphosis, you know, where he's doing all this you know, stuff built on, you know, the John Coltrane stuff. You know what I'm talking about. And then he comes back and plays with George Benson, and it's like he never even did any of that. He's, he's back to his kind of, you know, early style again. It's pretty much straight ahead jazz. But, you know, you can hear, you can hear all that abstract stuff still in his playing. Uh, his lines are not quite as melodic. They're a little bit more angular and pentatonic and I don't know. <laughs> He's just a great person to listen to and very, very difficult to imitate. I will say that.